Hello everyone and welcome to a very nice game uh, from the Havana tournament of 1965. It's not actually called that, it's the Capablanca Memorial tournament, the fourth Capablanca Memorial and one of the players that was invited to the tournament was uh, none other than Robert James Fisher. Uh, it is uh, It marks the first appearance of Fisher uh, since the Curaçao Candidates tournament of 1962. We haven't covered it in the Bobby Fisher saga but maybe you guys remember that Fisher uh, accused the Soviet players of uh, colluding with each other and uh, well sort of... Um, uh, robbing him of winning the the candidates tournament he said that okay that would they would just get quick draws against each other uh, then they would uh, push one of them uh, to the top and they would all play their absolute best against him so chances of him uh, winning were well not uh, not as great as uh, you know if it were a fair tournament uh, but okay that was in 1962 this is 1965 and um uh, Fisher was invited by by Fidel Castro himself. Uh, it was organized under the patronage of Che Guevara, and um, uh, they offered uh, three thousand dollars for first place in this tournament. Then they said, "Okay, we could maybe spend uh, maybe four and a half, five thousand uh, dollars, depending on how the other players rank in the tournament." But Fisher requested uh, uh, just for uh, showing up uh, just a participation fee of three thousand dollars. So he wanted uh, his participation fee to equal that of actually winning. The tournament and they gladly accepted however fisher was not granted a visa uh, to, to visit uh, havana and play the tournament but then uh, he got an idea or maybe he didn't get the idea i think the idea was maybe just attributed to him maybe some uh, someone else came up with it uh, he i said okay I'll, I'll i'll just play via a telex machine and i'm gonna telex the moose and uh we're gonna play like that i'm gonna play from the new york chess club and uh you know if you guys are okay with that uh, he would be happy to play that way and they did accept this for those of you who don't know what a telex machine is uh, this is the telex machine it's sort of a uh, uh some uh, basically technology that was used um uh, sometimes in the 80s, it's uh, the Telex network is a station-to-station -station switched network uh, of teleprinters similar to a telephone network using telegraph great connection uh, connecting circuits for two-way text-based messages. Telex was a major method of sending written messages electronically between businesses in the post-World War II period. Its usage went into decline as the fax machine uh, grew in popularity in the 1980s. So there you have it, um, basically a definition from Wikipedia. Uh, they, they of course didn't use this exact same one they used the one uh, I don't know it's not even the thumbnail I don't think we have a photo of the one they used uh, but uh, the board that Fisher used uh, at uh, you know uh, play over the moves that were sent to him via the telex machine uh, is still uh, I believe present in the Manhattan chess club so if you are from there or if you are just visiting you will be able to see this board uh, that Fisher used to play this tournament I don't know if, if it was used to play the entire tournament but it was definitely used to play this game against Smyslov uh, which is um, a, a very important game for this tournament I will mention uh, up front, uh, Vasily Smyslov uh, won the tournament, um, uh, but uh, also one of the reasons why this is such an incredible game. So let's check it out and then we're going to discuss it a little bit more. Uh, Fisher has the white pieces and he opens with pawn to e4. And this is uh, only round two of the tournament, so many more runs to be played. You want to do really well and okay, you can take a, 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 you know, a little bit of chances. It's not like it's the last round and you have to be... Uh, yeah, uh, you know, uh, playing for a draw or something like that. And okay, Smithlow replies with e5. We have knight to f3, knight to c6, and bishop to b5. Fisher goes for the Rui Lopez. We have a6, Morphe is defense by Smithlow, and bishop to a4. We have knight to f6, and now uh, Fisher played pawn to d3. Now, in those three years that we mentioned that Fisher did not play a single game in the international tournament uh, after the Curaçao candidates, uh, Fisher did a lot of studying on chess, and he... Uh, well, was very much inspired by none other than the first world champion Wilhelm Steinitz, uh, who was a big fan of this d3 move. And pretty much uh, from the era of Wilhelm Steinitz up until this point, no one ever used it. They thought it was uh, they, they thought it was a slower move, a weaker move that White just gives up his advantage. But Fischer uh, thought differently. He thought that Steinitz uh, had a great idea, and that this is in fact uh, an incredibly strong move. And uh, t today it is, of course, very much played. Castles and d3 are the top moves in the position. Uh, and here, uh, well, uh, d6 was played uh, by uh, Smyslov, and Fischer said that he didn't like this, that this was uh, very much passive for Black. 
that Fischer preferred to some like pawn to b5 and after the bishop moves the bishop b7 then okay white goes after the flank with a4 and so on or even uh, during the famous match as we've also covered that in the Morphy saga uh, this is the position from the uh, Morphy Anderson game uh, where uh, pawn to b5 uh, was played but the first bishop to c5 by Morphy Anderson continued with c3 then pawn to b5 then bishop to b3 uh, both Morphy and Anderson castled and now uh, Morphy uh, struck in the center with d5 captures captures and black has a very active game uh, you you should be very happy with your position here uh, but okay Smithel played d6 it's not terrible or anything Fisher just says okay maybe you, you could play a little bit uh, more active c3 uh, freeing up the c2 square for the bishop if needed and now bishop to e7 we have knight b to d2 castles and knight to f1 these are all very standard moves uh, uh, but of course this was played in, in uh, uh, 1965 so uh, even though today uh, they are very standard uh, there weren't as many games uh, played in this line back then and the idea is okay you could maybe just move the knight and castle or if uh black allows it you, you already have a very nice bishop you could place it here or you could place it on this diagonal and you could play h3 g4 put the knight on g3 postpone castling and just go for a for a brutal kingside attack so smithlow went b5 we have bishop to b3 and now uh he played pawn to d5 sort of mixing the line that morphy played uh but not really fisher says that d5 here is just uh not um and uh, not the best because you already played d6 you don't want to waste more time by playing d5 here you should just continue with the standard chasing of the bishop knight f5 bishop c2 then you play c5 uh, and so on uh, but uh, we have pawn to d5 and now fisher goes queen to e2 uh, we have d captures on e4 and now d captures on e4 we have bishop to e6 uh, offering a trade of bishops and fisher said that he was very surprised by this that smithlov would allow the doubling of the of the uh, pawn as uh, for those of you who are maybe new to chess Vasily Smyslov is a former world champion I did not mention this as I'm uh, you know I, I think of course everyone knows this uh, but yeah he was an incredibly strong player and he still is like I said he won this tournament so Fisher said all right I can double his pawns but it's probably not as relevant I mean if it was Smyslov would never allow it so Bishop captures on e6 f captures and now knight to g3 now Fisher says as uh, uh, I, I I am operating uh, with a lot of comments by Fisher himself he did cover this game in his book my my 60 uh, memorable games so we have a lot of um, uh, input from Bobby himself uh, and now uh, he says all right the knight probably won't be able to stay there because the pawn now is nicely covering this the knight is nicely covering h5 but we're going to castle we're going to move the rook we're going to remaneuver the knight and then the knight will be back in the game and here we have queen to d7 and it is now as of move 13 that this position has never been reached again so let's uh, see how Fisher continues. We have castles and rook a to d8. And here Fisher says that, oh, now I realize what Smyslov is doing. He's well, He wants to play queen to d3 and just trade queens. And with the queens off the board, it's going to be much, much harder to hone in on this uh, uh, doubled e pawn weakness. Uh, and okay, Fisher plays a4, very standard move. You want to attack the flank here. Uh, we have queen to d3 and Fisher trades. We have captures, captures, and now a captures on b5, a captures, and now... If Smyslov um, was allowed this bishop to c5 move, then he would have no problems. But Fisher is not about to allow it. He plays a rook to a6. Now he attacks the knight, and the knight cannot move as the pawn on e6 would be hanging. So here we have rook back to d6. Now the bishop must remain on e7. And now Fisher continues with his plan. Uh, king to h1. Now, uh, the idea behind king to h1 is that... Uh, uh, Smyslov would very much enjoy playing this freeing move knight to d4. To give you an example, let's say b4 is played, and b4 is the the best move pretty much in any position. And not just that, uh, in this game, b4 really is the best move in any position for white and black. And you will uh, see what I mean by this. Uh, Smyslov even says uh, this exact uh, same thing after the game. But here the problem would be knight d4 now attacks the rook, but also threatens knight captures on f3, which comes with check. And here you would just uh, be able to trade too much material. Knight captures on f3 with check, g captures, bishop captures, and you've solved all of your problems. So a black is very, very much okay here. So instead, king to h1 by Fisher first, stopping any knight to d4 ideas. And now we have knight to d7. And uh, Fisher says that uh, he was. Uh, 
uh, he was pretty sure that Smithlow would play b4 here, and he was also sure that he should play b4 here because uh, it's just, I mean, uh, it, it's the only move that black has, and with white playing b4, uh, white um, uh, just, uh, you know, robs black of the only move he has. Uh, but the problem was, Fisher thought that maybe it would weaken c3 too much, maybe it would weaken c4 too much, and Smithlow thought that maybe if he plays b4, then he weaken c4, then maybe Fisher can put a knight on c4, put more pressure on e5, and so on. So none of them actually touched the b4 square. So here we have knight to d7 by Smyslov and now bishop to e3. Uh, controlling the, the c5 square, we have rook to d8, and now h3. We have pawn to h6, and now rook f to a1, doubling up on the a file, and now uh, Smyslov goes for knight d to b8. Uh, uh, kicks away the rook, we have rook to a8, and now rook to d1 check, Smyslov trades off a pair of rooks. And Fisher doesn't like trading right away, because if he trades right away, captures, captures with check, then something like king to f7, and black is uh, doing fine here. So instead, Fisher just plays king to h2, forces Smyslov to capture on a1, so rook captures, we have rook captures, uh, and now knight to d7. And here is uh, probably Smyslov's last opportunity to play pawn to b4. You really want to play this move, but he played knight to d7. Like I said, he didn't want to allow knight to d2 to c4 to put more pressure on e5, uh, but it cannot be avoided, and now Fisher plays it himself. Pawn to b4. And now you will see just how difficult it is for uh, Smyslov to, to figure out what to play. We have king to f7, now knight to f1. Now uh, the idea is, of course, the knight um, uh, is coming to d2, then to b3, then to c5, or uh, if c4 can be played, maybe c4, the knight comes to c4, and so on. So bishop to d6 uh, adds more defense to the e5 pawn, and now pawn to g3. It seems like a, a waste of time or something, but uh, there's no time to waste here. Fisher has all the time in the world, and g3 is crucial to uh, properly continuing this game. The problem is if you if you play, let's say, knight 1 to d2, continuing with your plan, you again allow this weird knight to d4 move. And here the problem is, of course, okay, now we capture, c captures, e captures, and d4 comes with a discovery. And then after, let's say, e5, everything gets traded off. d captures on e3, e captures on d6, you're going to capture the knight here, d captures on c7, attacks the rook, you're gonna attack the rook, knight captures on d2, rook captures on c7, and dead draw uh, equal material, we've traded off everything, nothing to look forward to here. So instead, Fisher played pawn to g3, and now uh, this diagonal is forever closed, and the dreams of playing knight to d4 no longer uh, exist. We have knight to f6, and now uh, putting pressure on e4, just knight 1 to d2, defending it, we have king to e7, and now rook to a6. Again, putting pressure on the knight here, making it very difficult for Smyslov to defend. Now, uh, one thing that you could consider is king to d7. Fisher even mentions this in his book, but it's such a weird idea. King d7, knight to e1, now knight to b8, kicking away the rook, and after the rook attacks the pawn, king to c6. But this looks like such a weird square uh, to, to put your king on. Uh, I mean, the, the, the knight will come to d3, the other knight to b3. It's very hard to imagine the, the black king uh, remain here unharmed. So instead, we have knight to b8, attacking the rook, rook to a5, and now... Uh, we have pawn to c6. This is again uh, weakening of the position, uh, but what are you going to do? There is one thing, okay, knight to c6, maybe you could uh, sacrifice the b5 pawn and then play rook to a8, you give up the pawn to win the file, then you can use uh, the a file uh, to maybe put some pressure on the, on the white king, uh, but you already have the doubled e pawn. If, you, if, you're, if you're sacrificing a pawn, make it, make it the doubled pawn, don't give up the healthy b pawn. Uh, but okay, after rook a5, we have pawn to c6, and now we have king to g2. Now the idea is to bring the king over to e2, put the knight on d3, and uh, continue on improving the position. We have knight b to d7, and the king to f1. Not a lot for Smyslov to do here. Uh, we have uh, rook to c8. Here, again, Fisher thought that maybe Smyslov would go for knight to e8 to c7, guards the a8 square, and then try to trade off rooks with rook to a8. But no, he just goes rook to c8, uh, and Fisher goes knight to e1. And now, knight to e8. Now, uh, Smyslov goes for it, but Fisher says that it is much too late. And the problem is, if you play c5 here, okay, it's a pawn sacrifice, but not one that does all that much. Uh, Fisher would remain with the past b pawn, and this is, uh, well... In Fisher's hands, this is winning. So instead, knight to e8, we have knight to d3, and now knight to c7, hoping to get rook to a8 in, but Fisher uh, 
prevents this by playing the the move you thought that was never going to be played here and that is pawn to c4 very very strong point is that now if rook to a is played c5 traps the bishop on d6 so smyslov cannot allow this he has to react and pretty much your only move is um, uh, capturing or you know you, you play something like knight back to a but your knight came from there okay you would free up this diagonal for the bishop it's not great so b captures on c4 knight captures on c4 now puts even more pressure on this pawn uh, and now we have knight to b5 uh the problem is if you go rook to a8 now it's it's a very simple rook captures knight captures now you're going to play knight to a5 you go after the pawn and look at the passive knights you have to play knight to b8 to defend the pawn now you play bishop to a7 you threaten to kick away uh, to, uh, to uh, capture the knight and then win the pawn and after the king defends with uh, king to d7 you will play knight back to c4 and there is no defending the e5 pawn then you pick off the e5 pawn then you play f4 e5 you grab more space you win the game so that's uh, how fisher sees it so knight to b5 by smyslov and now rook to a6 just again uh, keeping all the tension not allowing uh smyslov to, to, to even find a square for any of his pieces uh smyslov plays uh king to f6 now the problem is if you go for knight to b8 which can be played uh look at this rook to a8 and now after knight to c7 uh, attacking the rook fisher says knight captures on d6 and it's game over uh, as the rook on c8 is hanging and after king captures you can just play bishop to c5 check now you will pick up the 5 pawn with check as well and after king to a8 you will just play rook to a7 uh, uh keep your extra pawn and uh well uh, it's just too passive of a position the knight bishop and rook combo are too deadly to deal with so instead after rook a6 king to f6 was played by smyslov and now okay you're attacking the pawn with the, both of the knights but now it's time to bring in more firepower uh bishop to c1 now the bishop is coming to b2 and then of course f4 will be played and there will be no no saving the pawn so bishop to b8 uh and now bishop to b2 and smyslov is officially out of moves he plays pawn to c5 the idea is okay maybe if um, uh, fisher starts f4 then uh, smyslov can play c capture some b4 and then okay the knight will not be able to capture back the knight will be needed to help out with the e5 square uh, but uh, as fisher says in his book it is a desperate bid for counterplay so knight to b6 uh, stopping all of this now the rook is hanging and there is no way to handle this knight captures some b6 rook captures and here okay the problem is if you play knight to d4 then just knight captures on c5 and uh, that's pretty much it uh, the the pass b pawn will, will be too powerful uh, also the knight cannot move the e6 uh, the e6 pawn is hanging or you're just going to capture it and then pick up the e6 pawn so uh impossible to play so instead c4 was played by smyslov fisher played knight to c5 and here smyslov played he actually played the strongest move recommended by the engine c3 and uh, here the game was adjourned to be continued um, uh, another day as you know in the olden days games were adjourned there were no chess engines so you could not cheat with an engine at home uh, but uh, Smyslov did not continue this game. Uh, uh, Smyslov um, uh, resigned and he said that he wanted to congratulate Fisher personally. Uh, so he uh, he uh, called him uh, via telephone and he said that okay congratulations on playing a beautiful active brilliant uh, brilliant game uh, and F both uh, Fisher and him agreed that yeah it was all due to him not playing pawn to b4. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, Smyslov even attributed his loss uh, to you know to his reluctance to play pawn to b4. So that ju that's just how important the b4 square is, especially when you play uh, uh, such a such a strict positional game. And here, Smyslov of course resigned because there is nothing to play here. I mean, uh, if, if if he didn't play this pawn to c3 move, what can he play? The knight here is hanging. He can play knight to c7, but then just knight to d7 check, and you lose the bishop. The king has to move. You're going to pick up the bishop here, and that's pretty much it. Uh, here, after pawn to c3, it's pretty it's it, the exact same thing, because after uh, Fisher, uh, let's say, plays pawn to c1, the knight is still hanging. You're going to play knight to d4, but now just rook capture some b8. That's it. Rook captures knight to d7 check uh, with, with a beautiful pork here. King to e7, knight captures, and uh, that's all there is. Uh, so yeah, after c3, uh, Fischer won this brilliant game. And even though this was a, a very important win for Fischer against a former world champion in only round two uh, of the Capablanca Memorial Tournament, uh, it was uh, it was Smyslov who won the entire thing. Uh, here are the standings of the tournament. Um, 
as you can see, Smithville won the tournament with 15 and a half uh, out of 21 with 13 wins and three losses. Uh, and second place shared with uh, by Boris Ivkov, uh, Effingel and Robert James Fisher. Now, uh, although uh, we all love Bobby Fisher so much that we cover this tournament uh, by talking about Fisher or we talk about Smyslov or we maybe talk about general things like that. But this was, uh, in fact, it was this was supposed to be Boris Ivkov's tournament. Uh, he had a brilliant tournament. He was leading for the entire tournament and uh, uh, going up into the final two games uh, um, in the penultimate round, he lost. Uh, Gilberto Garcia, who, as you can see, got last place in the tournament. Uh, one of his wins was against none other than Borislav Ivko. He played a terrible blunder, one uh, unfitting even a, a 1600 player. And uh, I mean, it, it, it completely broke him. Uh, he lost that game and then he lost um, uh, the, the, the final uh, game as well. I think against Kolmo or, or Pachman or maybe even against Robash. I think he lost to Robash in the final round. And uh, yeah, it was supposed to be his tournament, but it just wasn't. You know, that's also one of uh, one of the things that you have to be able to do. Not just play one game great, not just play two game, not just ten, but you have to be able to play all of them uh, in the tournament with the exact same strength. Something that Bobby Fischer could do, something obviously Smyslov could do, and that's why uh, they won tournaments. Uh, but yeah, uh, just one of the games uh, that uh, I, I wanted to show you, really a uh, uh, true positional br brilliancy by Bobby Fischer. Uh, we're probably going to check out some other games from this tournament, not just Fischer's games. Uh, we're going to uh, cover some other uh, games as well, as I've never covered a single game uh, from this tournament because uh, we've skipped, basically we've mentioned the Curaçao Candidates tournament, we've skipped all of this, uh, you know, and we've... Uh, went straight into the um, uh, 1950 and 1959 U.S. Uh, championship that went, you know, to the um, uh, interzonal tournament of, of Palma de Mallorca, then into the candidates matches, and that's how we basically started and ended the Bobby Fischer saga. But yeah, this is a beautiful tournament. I'm going to uh, cover some games, maybe even a lot of them, while I'm still preparing the Steinitz saga. But yeah, you can see how even, even the great Bobby Fischer was influenced by Wilhelm Steinitz. He employed D3 here against Smyslov, and Sp Smyslov just was wasn't uh, ready for it. D3, I mean, such a docile looking move, but, uh, you know, it take, it took the, uh, the, the great former world champion by surprise and he just didn't find uh, a great way of, of defending. He tried the bishop to e6, he doubled his pawns, uh, and okay, he, it was... Um, uh, possible to do this for, for some time, but in the end, uh, Fisher just broke him. And this is something that uh, Fisher's opponent said about Bobby Fisher playing against him. It, it's like being in a room uh, with walls just closing in on you, and there is no way out. There are no doors, there are no windows, and the walls will just continue closing in, and that's pretty much what uh, happened in this game. So yeah, if you have any game of your uh, uh, choosing that you would like to see from this tournament, do use hashtag suggestion, and I will show it. But like I said, I'm probably going to show many more uh, games from this tournament seems like a, a lovely tournament to, to check out uh so yeah uh, that's the game i uh, hope you guys uh, enjoyed it uh, i would like to thank uh, federico torres fizalco dan mccormick uh, james eugene cashman uh, angel musa and pedro baldo for your contribution to my channel thank you a lot i really appreciate it as usual you can check two of my previous videos here thank you for watching and i will see you soon continuing to check up on your wonderful suggestions and whatever else happens in the chess world uh, so thank you all i will see you soon and have an excellent rest of your day